welcome to episode 13a of the interdisciplinary history podcast gluten free pizza has upped its game good it to is hear. not cardboard good to hear i'm not breaking the teeth on it and it actually tastes like a regular pizza which is a high standard with with pizza so not sponsored okay not sponsored. Not... I haven't even started recording it. Maybe I'll just bleep out the name of the uh, retailer that you said. <laughs> just bleep out and yes, all of those are bleeps. Audience, you have just heard beeps. Just <laughs> Constance Wary. Uh, yeah, we we are technically uh, explicit, but that's more thematic. I don't think I've sworn much so far on here, which is a personal accomplishment. Uh, speaking of which, hello audience, we are back after, it's gonna round out to a few days over a month since we've last published an episode. If you're hearing this on the day it comes out, Victoria and I are done our spring summer courses, so we have a couple of, couple of scant few moments of peace. We got a little bit of time to ourselves, it's nice. And obviously uh, doing the research for this, which is probably something we should explain what we're doing. We're starting a series discussing Alias Grace, which is a 2017 miniseries uh, based on the book of the same title by uh, Margaret Atwood, who today's episode is going to be focusing on immigration and dem domesticity in Margaret Atwood's Alias Grace series, which came out in 2017 as a sort of combination between Netflix and and CBC. They had sort of a deal going on a couple of years ago. If you've seen the show Anne with an E, that was sort of part of that partnership. Anyways, we're going to be looking at this show. Each episode that we're going to do is going to focus on a different thing, and today I'm going to focus on domesticity, Sloan's going to focus on immigration. Yeah, so uh, the next three episodes are going to be thematically linked around this show. They're all going to relate to pre-confederation Canada because that is the setting of the show that we're going to be discussing. So the story of Alias Grace is based actually off real life historical murder case that occurred over 100 years ago and has basically the same names, Grace Marks. So this is based on an actual court case and the story revolves around the story of Grace Marks. It follows the setting of Margaret Atwood's novel pretty closely actually. I was really impressed with how much of the, uh, the original book they managed to weave in. But it is based on a true story where two servants murdered their employers and basically we go from there. And this story uh, his framing device revolves around a character by the name of Simon Jordan, and he is an early psychologist who really wants to understand what, what makes a criminal do their actions and such. He interviews Grace Marks, tries to get at the root of why, what happened during the crime. Is she an amnesiac, or is she just a manipulative person who got... And basically, we weave that between her memories and the present, where she's in prison, and he is basically struggling with his landlady, who has been left by her husband, destitute, and her servants, because she can't pay for them. So he's been bas basically forced into a situation that is not ideal for a man who is of his station. And we really sort of go from there. Yeah, so this is a six-part miniseries that was produced by CBC in conjunction with Netflix. It's based on the 1996 novel by the same title, written by Margaret Atwood. Both the novel mm -hmm. and the television series take place in mid-1800s Canada. It's a fictionalized retelling, and we really do have to stress that this borrows a lot of names from history. This is based loosely on events. But it's not actually meant to be a documentary on Grace Marx's life or any of the lives of the people depicted. So the reason Victoria and I are approaching this is we want to look at the way this series gives an impression of pre-Confederation Canada. And we're pretty close to Confederation at this time. The majority of the series, when she's recounting her past and her conviction, takes place in mm -hmm. 1859. The flashbacks go back further than that. Really, the story she's recounting starts probably about 1840, because there's lots of references to the Upper Lower Canada rebellion. Obviously, Margaret Atwood, if you're Canadian, is a household name. For anyone who doesn't know, she is a 
pretty prolific Canadian writer. She is the noted feminist writer. She was our poet laureate for a while. Other works of note by her are, of course, The Handsmaid's Tale, or um, if you're familiar with the Oryx and Crake trilogy. This being a piece of historical fiction is very much coming from the perspective of being a commentary and a critique on the work that's being done. Again, it bears repeating that she is not a historian by trade, she is a writer of fiction by trade, though she does engage in some historical work while she's writing this. This series was fairly positively received, uh, largely because of the esteemed authorship of the source material and the high production values when it first came out in 2017. Yeah, and I think it's also important to discuss how Grace is an unreliable narrator. So when we're talking about, like, we're not looking at, we're, we're basically just looking at this, at this from a historical lens and we're not treating this as fact. This is fiction and also Grace, you can't trust her in the book or in the show. Like, you can't trust whatever the hell she's saying because she even says that she changes it to fit the person who's listening to her story. Yes. which is certainly Margaret Atwood creating some commentary on agency in the era that this takes place in. Like, there certainly is this kind of feminist track throughout where you've got to watch your own back, you've got to say whatever needs to be said. Victoria and I are not seeking to evaluate the character of Grace Marks or her motivations or anything like that. We more want to look at the world that this fictionalized Grace Marks and these other fictionalized characters are dropped into and talk about how good of an impression it gives or where it lacks a good impression of pre-Confederation Canada. And specifically Toronto. Obviously, Canada, prior to Confederation, is incredibly mm -hmm. regionalized, incredibly atomized. Most of this story yes. takes place in Toronto and uh, other large eastern centres. Sorry, every single time I hear the word Toronto, I think of the way I, I said Toronto as a child, because I, I lived in Toronto for my first year of schooling, so the, the dialect really made an effect on my speech for a little bit there. Whenever I hear Toronto, I think of how I used to say it as Toronto, and I used to get teased for that, but it's funny. There's a fun fact yeah. for you about me. Also, I think it's important to say we don't know basically anything about Grace Marks except for like from her confessions. They are written down, and we will provide a link to them, but there really isn't much information about her, especially after she is pardoned when she leaves the prison, because she drops off the map. We don't know what happened to her, and the ending of this show is yeah. really just completely yeah, fictional. This is not a series of episodes about Grace Marks. This is going to be a series of episodes about the yes. depiction of mid-1800s Canada that Margaret Atwood and the producers have crafted. Yes, and I just wanted to clarify that because we don't know much about Grace at all. So, like, that's where fiction yeah. comes in. Yeah, and I think more broadly, I mean, we've talked about it before on the show that we feel that... Like, I wouldn't want to turn Grace Marks into a figure of history or, you know, like, again, we get into that kind of, uh, even though Grace Marks is a woman, we would get into that great man history. You can, uh, maybe to use an amalgamy, mm -hmm. you can yes. read about Al Capone or you can actually learn about the Prohibition era. We are doing the latter, hopefully a little bit, and we hope you'll learn with us, listeners. Mm -hmm. All right, I am good to go with immigration as our theme. Yes. Yeah, so, so, like many people living in Canada in the mid 1800s, particularly the early mid 1800s, third decade, fourth decade, fifth decade, that area, Grace Marks is not yeah, born in do, Canada. Yeah. Grace Marks is emigrating with her family. There's a lot of very interesting but very subtle things that this series shows to do with the process and the nuance and the experiences of people migrating to Canada in this time period. Um, one of the things that I think they get really, really well done is looking at the culture shock and how there is this very Eurocentric idea that there's a profound difference between um, the born Canadian and the emigrant Canadian. And I'm not talking about born Canadian, meaning uh, people of indigenous heritage, although that's really what that should mean, but the Eurocentric viewpoint of people of European his ancestry being born in Canada now. And they do a really good foil with that between between Grace 
and another person about the same age as her who is born in Canada and has uh, a, a few generations behind her of being in the emergent European settlement in Canada. So, Victoria, I'm curious if you were going to think about something that comes up in regards to immigration in this show, what stands out to you? It's just how brutal it is um and it's not really just the lies but just how, how it shows just how brutal traveling across could be just like everyone is getting yeah. sick and like people like they're given rules but people don't really follow them and they're just not feeling well um grace's mother passes away yeah. on the voyage and you just sort of see her unceremoniously dropped into the ocean is the realities of immigration at that time Yes, and absolutely. We've got transatlantic immigration happening. There's a few different factors coming through. Obviously, there's the very appealing promise that, like, come to the quote-unquote new world, expand the British Empire. It's something very interesting that I came across in the research for this that would not have pertained to Grace Marks or her family, just based on the timeline. But there were experiments done in subsidizing emigration throughout the first half of the 19th century in the British Empire into Canada. 1812, 1823, and then 1825-26. You've got real efforts being made to bring families over. Grace Marks' family comes from Ireland, and she has a couple of very good lines that are lines that the character is saying, but are very significant to understanding the window into the past that Margaret Atwood's trying to create. So one of the things that Grace reflects on is that they're from Ireland, but they're Protestant. And as we know in the British Empire, there has always been that conflict between the Anglicans and the Catholic Church, or the Papists as they're often referred to. That is a very significant part of Britain coming in to North America. So at this time period, there is still the conflict between the French and the English that's happening here on the backdrop of the continent. There's a huge Irish Catholic population that first settles in the Maritimes and then moves into the inland. And one of the things that gets noted by British officials in this time period, even when you've got British Catholic citizens, is there is this fear of British supremacy being under mind by the Catholics, but also the commonality that is potentially going to exist between Irish Catholics and French Catholics, and the potential unity that could come from that. Nonetheless, Irish Catholic migration into British fishing stations was essential as a chief source of labor. And that continues to be true when we see Grace eventually becoming a uh, domestic servant. Yeah, it's been a while since we recorded. I forgot what it's like. This isn't much of a dialogue and it's really bumming me out. <laughs> sure. Sorry. <Yeah. laughs> Sorry, do you, want, do you want me to put it equipped? I'm just interested in what you're saying, so I'm like... It's interesting because, like, once again, I was really excited to see as an adaptation how close it was to the book. And basically, Grace is forced into being a domestic servant by her father, who drinks a lot, throws away their money, uh, doesn't pay the rent on the lot they're renting from a, the landlady that he tried to seduce. They didn't keep that in the show, but... Yeah, and actually, I'm, I'm glad you bring her father up, because that's another thing that Margaret Atwood does really well, or this show at least does very well for setting the backdrop of it. It's, again, another little, like, one line about the Protestantism, and Grace references the political unrest that is happening in Ireland around the time they're leaving, and she's referencing the fact that her father is forced to leave with the family because he is in what is essentially political trouble. Um, in Orangeman's house was burned down, is the expression that's given. Uh, in Orangeman being a Protestant. Uh, so that's, that's a very good line that sort of sets the political backdrop. I think that it's definitely something that needs more context if you're going to understand it, and that's why I bring it up now. 
Yeah, um, I think I should also mention, like, just because they don't give that context in the show as well, Grace's family wasn't able to pay for it in the books. It was Grace's mother's family, because she stepped down to marry Grace's dad, and it was basically her uncle and aunt who paid for it, because they had been taking care of the family for them for years, but now they were having kids of their own. Yeah. They can't do it anymore. Go over to Canada, go and get uh, that land. Yeah, we should probably explain also maybe the kind of family background that Grace is coming from. So Grace is the oldest child, in, at least in the show, I believe she's depicted as being about, it's really hard to tell. I would say she's about 14 coming over to Canada. I don't know if it's stated in the book. She's 12 going on 13. She, basically, when she applies for their job, the landlady who basically trying to kick her dad out was like, okay, say you're 13. That way you can work at the Elderman Parkinson's. That is one of the choices, I think, that having, I mean, Sarah Gadon is a great actor, fantastic actress, but she's clearly a 20-something woman playing a 13-year-old. Yes. Yeah, but she plays everything from 13 to, like, late 40s, 50s in the show, which is perhaps a downfall of this show, is not having a child act I think that the costume department did an excellent job of trying to age her up, but I do think that you miss out on just how young she's coming over, and as we get into discussions of domesticity, and we get into discussions of gender, and labor, and class, I do think that that is maybe something that gets lost a little bit. I do want to talk about the family experience a little bit. But I think that the other thing to... Yeah, yeah, we'll talk about the family experience. So, a historian by the name of Arrington uh, has a book entitled uh, Immigrant World, Transatlantic, and Transatlantic Communities. It'll be linked below. But one of the things that she talks about is despite the immense physical separation that is experienced by immigrants coming over to Canada... There is still very strongly and very distinctly connections to home. I think we generally have an idea that communities of immigrants tend to, once they come over, you sort of people coming from the same areas tend to settle in the same areas and build community that way through language, through cultural practices, that sort of stuff. But there is a very important and well-documented part of life that people continue to write letters, continue to be connected to family back home. And we don't see any of that in the show, we don't see Grace getting to experience any of that. The circumstances that Grace comes over on, it makes sense why that's lacking. But we're going to talk about the world that this is meant to take place in. It really does bear talking about the fact that her mother dies on the voyage. She loses a lot of those connections. And this is an era where your connections are so important that even after you've lost your connections, you can still be judged very profoundly by them. Grace, eventually, not long after settling, as Victoria has mentioned, takes work. We don't see her interact with her family at all past then. Once she arrives at the household that she's going to be doing domestic work at, her family ceases to exist for her. She changes employment a few times through not trust- and I hope I'm not stepping on your toes right now, Victoria- not trusting her father to use her wages appropriately, she stops sending the money back to her family. And that's interesting because we have this idea, I think, that media tends to promote, that you come to a new place and you get a fresh start. The world that this takes place in really doesn't allow that. This is still a highly hierarchical society. This is still a society that cares very much about reputation, that cares very much about extraction and origin. And the line that stands out to me about that, where Grace is, this is in like probably the first 15 minutes of the first episode, Grace is reflecting on the fact that she's been convicted of murder. And there is this sort of stream of consciousness quality no, to no. it. Uh, and she's talking about herself and the man that she is convicted with. They're co-convicted. And she's talking about a news article that she read about herself and McDermott, who's the other murderer. And she quotes the article in saying, both were Irish by their own admission. And there's this very, like, not overly dramatic pause, but like a good, like, full stop pause in her musings. And then she goes, as if being Irish were a crime in and of itself. Absolutely, that is a attitude and a sentiment that exists in the British lens in this period. Ireland in, is in and of itself a 
colony of Britain. Uh, it's been a colony much longer than these kind of expansionist imperial colonies that we are thinking of in this period, but it is. And there are all these negative stereotypes that have been chronically applied. Criminality. We hear Grace's father refer to her and her sibling as, as a bunch of thieving Irish bastards. Which again, the oldest is 12. The oldest is 12. And yeah, those attitudes are not consistent throughout the series, but I think they do really set up the world well in reminding you that this is a highly hierarchical, this is a very judgmental society, and a society very concerned with pedigree. Being Canadian born, or being, you know, born of uh, European immigrants in Canada, is not strictly an asset in this time either, because the Britons who are from Britain are the best, is the social attitude that exists. However, we do see things like Grace is eventually going to be employed by someone who is of good Scottish stock. And that is acceptable in the lens of the society. So I just, I find it, I find that line to be really worth unpacking. Yeah, and it's also, I think, because it also, Grace is still treated with suspicion once yeah. she's in the workforce. Not only by the Alderman Parkinson's, because, not only just because she is of Irish origin, but also because she knows that their son impregnated a girl who eventually got her an abortion because he didn't do right by her. And also, sort of with Nancy, who is kind of two-faced in a way, according to Grace. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Nancy, Nancy is an interesting character that I hope we will talk about at some point. Nancy happens to have the last name Montgomery, which is referenced in the show as there is a tavern that is burnt down around the time of the rebellions, 1837 to 1838, that is Montgomery's tavern. And it's not said that she was a kin of the Montgomery's that owned this tavern that is associated with the rebels, but just having that name and that association and not really knowing, is she connected, how close are the kinship ties, is it worth worrying about, is something that she carries a little bit too. On the topic of immigration in this period, there's something to be said also for the nods to the fact that when you make it to Canada, you're not always going to stay in Canada. Now, by and large, moving uh, from Britain or, you know, the European parts of the British Empire... God, I hate saying British Empire so much. I'm trying so hard to, like, talk about the British colonies, but not come across as, like... I don't know. The British Empire has done a fantastic job of just making it impossible to talk about it without sounding like you're glorifying it. And we don't, like... So hard to say. But yeah, like, it's largely... Like moving to Canada was a decision not easily reversed. However, there is yeah. reference made Colonial. to... So Grace arrives at this household where she is about to, you know, begin working and take on this domestic labor. Uh, Mary yeah. Whitby, who ends up being a pretty key kind of coming of no, age character definitely for not. Grace, is introducing her to other people who work in the household. And she's introduced to a woman older than her, but probably not a older woman. Again, and it's very hard to tell what age the actors are supposed to be playing. But someone, a woman who's probably starting to look at getting married. You no, know, a woman who's open to that and is not so much a child, though she's still young and still probably underage. So, like, she's a child, but you know what I mean. And after this very brief uh, non commutative interaction, Mary says something along the lines of, don't worry about her, she's just very morose because her, her young man, meaning her, love interest, her beau. Not love interest, we're talking allegedly about real people. Um, someone who was courting her was arrested during the rebellion and deported to mm -hmm. Australia. Transport is still being used very significantly by the British Empire right now. There's an article written you by all the time a you need historian friends. named Palmer called Canada Australia, the Paradox of class formation. Obviously because criminal is treated as a social class, it's not a social class you want to be in, but it is a recognized social status and it is a way that you can be categorized in this time period very significantly. 
Yeah, absolutely. So actually, I was thinking when you talked about how Mary Whitney sort of just sort of guides Grace along, I was thinking about how the narrative between Grace and Mary Whitney is a mentor narrative. And typically with a mentor narrative, mentor takes someone under their wing, they grow, mentor dies, and then the, uh, the protege has to move on and typically take a protege of their own. Grace doesn't do that. She kind of keeps her knowledge to herself. So I just thought I'd mention that. So there's a lot of detail in this show and I was really impressed with it. Like just the things that they included about the past and sort of just like everyday life in there. Grace, because she comes from a working class family and her mother is dead, she is forced very quickly to take on a new role as a mother for her siblings after the death of her mother, which is very difficult because she, you know, she's 12. She only really has like sewing experience. She's not as much of a cook as like her mom was. And she's having to deal with this difficult familial environment with her father, who is unstable. And uh, there is a scene in the show which is very uncomfortable. Trigger warnings for depictions of uh, child sexual abuse. She's forced into the workforce because of his drinking and the fact that he is not providing for his family. Which in this time is really bad because there was this expectation that men would provide. But he's not a good father. He's not a good figure. He doesn't... Yeah, and... That is fairly well documented, uh, at least in the secondary sources that I've come through, that that is a really, maybe underdepicted depicted uh, previously in our ways that we talk about immigration and settlership, because we tend to have uh, family migration stories that take very male-centric approaches. You know, it's, it's a man came over with his wife and children, not a woman came over with her husband or a child came over with parents. Everything that I can tell in this time period is the fact that the presence of women settling was vital in terms of having labor, vital in terms of settlement. But while it's still very important to masculinity and patriarchy in this time to have a male head of household winning bread, it's not uncommon for women and older female children, also older male children, to have to enter the workforce. Yes, it's it's very common. Like we're seeing the uh, industrial revolution, although it's still early Canada, so it's sort of not as advanced as say like other places across. But we're still sort of seeing a movement forward, especially because people are able to move up in society. Uh, we see social mobility, especially in the character of Nancy Montgomery. Yeah. She moves her way from a servant to an, a housekeeper, and then to the mistress of Thomas Kinnear. When Grace moves in, she's forced to grow up really fast. But she doesn't have really that kind of guidance because her father is a failed patriarch, her mother is gone, she doesn't have the influence that she needs to grow and to learn. Like, she can sew, she has diff some skills like with food and, and chores, but she's not there just yet. And so when she starts working at the Alderman Parkinson's, we sort of see her start to flourish and learn, specifically from Mary Whitney, who acts as a mentor and a friend. Mary teaches her how to do certain things, certain jobs, and also just sort of how to be a kid again, because they have fun together. They sort of, they have these habits where they, or there's this very pivotal scene where it's the apple scene, sort of like an old wives' tale where you cut a uh, apple and peel it and then you throw it over your shoulder and it gives you the first letter of the name of the person you shall marry. Grace sort of sees this as a joke like she doesn't really take it seriously and it's Mary Whitney who does because she's still a kid even though she believes she gives Grace all this information well don't don't let anyone do this to you but she's still a person who has fallen for these things and has had these issues happen to her like Mary Whitney is coerced into a relationship with the younger son of the Alderman Parkinson's and she with that she becomes pregnant and um, he makes promises to her that he'll marry her and then when she reveals that she's with child he dumps her and she's forced to get an abortion but that's off topic that's me just sort of giving a summary. The show has a lot of really great details about them doing the laundry, putting all the work into the chores, and having studied with my work in food history and sort of how chores are done in that time, um, there's a great book which is um, How to Cook the Victorian Way, which is based on the cookbook by Avis Crocom. They have a lot of great detail about how servants would conduct living, just sort of doing the laundry and how much work it was, especially like say if it's like white clothing, because that was a lot of work to keep things white. Because 
with darker clothing, it's easier to hide stains. And you're also wearing these things constantly, so there's going to be sweat. With white, that was a show sign of money. And so when she's got all those crisp white sheets out, it shows how the uh, Alderman Parkinson's have that kind of money in order to be able to afford that. And also the quilts. Quilts are a very labor-intensive process. Having made one, and it took me over two months, it is a grueling grueling process of cutting, recutting, and also sewing, but not all the way. You have to sew little patches, and then you have to sew again, and again, and again. It's very repetitive, and it takes a long time, and it's oftentimes we just see quilts as something that's not really appreciated, but the domestic work effort that goes into creating these garments and these items, that's what Grace is mostly appreciated for, is because she has these skills as a seamstress. That's the one thing that she's valued for, is because she can sew, and she sews these very intricate quilts, and it's why quilts are so important to her character because she is a very methodical. She only reveals certain parts of herself and her story to Dr. Jordan and to her eventual husband, J.B. Walsh. With quilts, she makes it very clear how quilts are a sort of flag, that they mark the bed as a place of danger because that's where people are born and that, that they die, like whether it's through sleep or it's through childbirth. For her, it's a very dangerous place, but also the things that can happen to bed, like sexual assault. It's just sort of... This show and Margaret Atwood's book do a really great job of showing how the domestic life at this time was dangerous. Like it was grueling, it was hard, it was difficult. Yeah, absolutely. So we, <laughs> Victoria's talking so much about quilts because there's this really poetic long monologue that uh, Grace Marks's character in the show delivers one of the first times she's being interviewed by Dr. Jordan. Dr. Jordan is in the series because and we're going to talk about this more in the subsequent episodes that we do for this. At this time, incarceration and the penal system is developing. And there is a very noticeable movement in the 1900s amidst a lot of other social reformist type attitudes that prisoners should be reformative, prisons should be reformative, and the justice system should be trying to get people integrated back into society. So you have charitable organizations that are campaigning to get people acquitted or campaigning to get people leniency. So there's one of these social societies that is upper class people trying to do better uh, or to better society, which, you know, is so fucking paternalistic of the upper classes. But whatever. We know that most suffragettes were uh, wealthy white women. They, they started things off well. We've got a lot to go still from there. But Dr. Jordan is an American psychiatrist who's brought in essentially to assess that Grace yeah. should be ready to come back into society and should be reintroduced into Canadian society and doesn't need to spend more time in the penitentiary. Grace spends some time in a asylum, which we're going to talk about in a future episode, and then she's in the penal system now. We see also the fact that convicts have opportunities to do labor and earn wages. Grace herself, because she's... Like, she's a notable person. She had a very highly publicized trial. She's been in prison for about 10 years now on very good behavior. So she's actually doing domestic work in the wardens of the prison's household. And she's kind of this curiosity that the warden's wife and all the friends of the warden's wife can uh, look at as she serves tea, and it's very interesting for that. But she delivers a monologue about quilts. And whether or not you specifically want to look at the history of quilts, I think that that monologue means so much for reminding people who study history not to discredit smaller things. Grace is talking, obviously, a lot about these kind of conventions and these cultural artifacts that quilts actually are and they, how they have these meanings. And she lists off names of them that remind you just how integrated Christian faith is into the lives of people from the British Empire. One of the quilts is called a uh, Jacob's Tree or a uh, Jacob's Pear, Tree of Paradise. Some so you see the way that these illusions are being brought into craft. And we're in a pre-industrialized society. The Industrial Revolution doesn't hit Canada really until the post-Confederation yes. period. Exactly. So if you, uh, you know, are someone who appreciates Marx's writings and the idea of species beings and creativity, artifacts like that do have a lot of merit. And I think that Margaret Atwood, while not being a historian herself, is putting a good message out there for looking at cultural history. 
Yes, and looking at sort of the details that you wouldn't really expect and sort of the details that are not, like, when we look at history, they're not the first things that we think about. Specifically, yeah, the quilts and how the quilt is important to Grace's character because it means that she's finally ha been given the chance to make one for herself, to make the life for herself that she wants. Yes, which is ultimately what, you know, coming, emigrating is meant to mm -hmm. promise. And I think as a metaphor, if we under, want to understand not just this fictional character and some of the narrative things, I think it's a very good uh, descriptor of the way that the lower classes labor and the things that they create are what actually gives the upper classes all the opportunities that are promised by coming to North America in this period. Because it's the upper classes who actually mm -hmm. get all the things that are promised, who get the perks and the good life. Yes. They get the benefits and everyone else does the work for them. They, they're all the same. They just like to pretend they're better. Yes. Trying to focus on the world that this story is situated in, and not just the behaviors of the characters, but trying to actually focus in on that. I think that it's very important to remember that there is political awareness of women and of people confined to domestic spheres. We still, in this time period, have a very marked distinction between public life and private life. Public life being political, being visual, and being male, and domestic life being feminine. The exclusion from politics does not lead to a lack of political awareness. Mary Whitney herself is a daughter of a revolutionary, or a rebel. She is not unaware of it. She has listened to the same political rhetoric, and she's able to repeat it. And you can see the way that that is so politically aware of everybody. Not just the people who have public lives, but everybody is aware of the rebellion that was put down, and everybody's got an opinion on it, whether or not they're supposed to. Yes, and there, it's like it's unavoidable. And uh, like even though Mary Whitney says, "Oh yeah, we're not supposed to talk about politics," they absolutely talk about politics in the uh, in the workplace. And um, what I was meaning to get at is that, like, with the, like, yeah, of course they would all use the same outhouse. Of course they would all use like the chamber pots, and that there would be a whole routine that they would have to go to to clean them and make sure that every, they're back in the same place so that the uh, the sort of upper class people uh, that they are working for, they don't notice that they're gone in the first place. They're sort of meant to be silent, who don't comment or take part in any of the life, but meant to yeah. just cater to every single need. Yeah. It's interesting that you use the phrase workplace. I think that this show does a really good job of reminding the audience that for people employed as domestic help, there is no separation between your work and your living space because you live where you work. And yet there is, like, there mm -hmm. is that privacy that exists when Mary and Grace are in spaces that the household owners wouldn't go into or when they're not present so that's yeah i agree with you on that thank you yeah and i think there's going into that household space when mary whitney dies their place is invaded by people who haven't been in there before which is like the servants but also the owner's wife sort of place that was hers and mary whitney's was taken from grace and so now she's sort of in shock about it also like she's just lost a friend it's difficult. But that's sort of that wall between the servant and the, uh, and the, uh, well, it's sort of hard not to talk about domesticity without talking about class because they're so intertwined because the domestic life is often connected with the working life at this time because there's long hours. It's extremely grueling. They're meant to work late into the night and then be up at oh dark stupid in the morning to start work all over again. And sometimes, like, even though you're off the clock, you're meant to be doing other things. In this case, uh, in the show's case, they're talking about how even though they weren't working, uh, they were still at risk of being sexually assaulted by their uh, bosses or their, their bosses' families. Uh, that was a real danger in the workplace for female servants. One of my courses I took, we talked about how when women started getting into the workplace, there was sort of people were working to make money, but also 
there's really no jobs for women. Factory jobs are terrible. Teaching jobs are difficult because it's hard to get them because because men want them. Also, women will get paid less, so they can't really do as much as they can, and they, they can't work after they're married. In the book, Grace talks about how basically anyone who was a servant there was just working in to pay a part of their dowry when they got married, because there's this expectation that they would eventually have to put away their, their career goals for marriage, for children, which I uh, think is a real fear for, for Grace because her work was what gave her freedom, but also it is what con ultimately controlled her. Yeah, I mean, I think it's worth mentioning that if you are not part of the upper class, and you're also not a artisan or a merchant, the concept of a career is not really there. It's labor, and certainly labor situations change or they endure, but it's a bit anachronistic to talk about careers. Certainly we use that phrase uh, in kind of a contemporary lens when we talk about, you know, someone spending their whole life in domestic service. But a career in this time period really refers more towards the activities of the upper classes. So if you're in a management position, if you're in a political position, that word is applicable. We today talk about, you know, careers in the household as our broader yes. understanding of it. It's not really what's looked at in this time period, at least from the readings I've done. Women in general, they work, they don't have careers. That's a very masculine, and again, that publicness of it, that working outside the home. I will say, as we talk about morality, which is obviously a uh, laden, one of the things that's mm -hmm. talked about, specifically in discussions of Irish Catholic women coming into Canada, is in yes. general, women immigrants are presented in literature as homogenous and powerless. And I think this show does a very good job of showing the dynamics that exist in a household between women. Because you've got the mistress of the house, you've got housekeepers. That, to me, was very well done for showing that the domestic sphere is a working sphere, and it falls into those metaphors. You can use a biological metaphor and say, you know, it's, it's a system, it's a body, everybody's got their own stuff. Or you can project yourself into the Industrial Revolution and say that it's a well-oiled machine. But one of the things is women are expected to provide moral guidance in the household. You've talked a little bit about Mary Whitney's uh, pregnancy that has unfortunate outcomes for her. It is not the man of the house who is dealing with the fact that his son got someone pregnant. It is the woman of the house dealing with the fact that her son got someone pregnant. The expectation of moral guidance is so significant. Even when you see the way that the housekeeper instructs like, there's a peddler named Jeremiah who ends up popping up in this story a few times. He's invited in the household to trade some wares. He's selling handkerchiefs, buttons, and the like. He's got a lot of stuff spread out. And it's the housekeeper and it's other women who are instructing him to make sure he's acting properly towards the women. The moral guidance that is expected of women in this period is highly significant, despite the fact that the men do have power over situations. So I think that that is something Margaret Atwood really, really wants us to get, because that is really the body of what she does. That's a theme that endures throughout, is women self-policing, but within the confines of patriarchy. Yes, she does it really well, and it, I think she also displays really well sort of how, even though there is a difference between master and servant, and that the servant is meant to sort of just be there, be invisible, and not really care about the entire situation. The servants do notice quite a lot, and like they comment on it quite a lot to one another. This show shows how gossip is a powerful, powerful thing at this time. How it can basically just ruin anyone. In a lot of shows, in, in a lot of period dramas depicting this era, you often see all the grandmothers commenting from one between one another, but it's also the servants. And the servants, because they are so intimately tied with the masters of the house, they yes. will notice things that 
just aren't really that the church ladies wouldn't really get to comment about say like if we're gonna bring this back to say Nancy Montgomery there's a cheeky cameo by Margaret Atwood where she's basically shaming Nancy for appearing at church when she is a, apparently a fallen woman they say she has had a child that she's and that she might be having an affair with Thomas Kinnear there's really no way to prove that unless like say that they're listening to the servants and the servants are the ones who could easily just spread that information yeah reputation is again so significant in this period Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely uh do you have anything else to say like about the way domesticity is portrayed on the show Yes, I was really excited to get into discussion about the food preservation. I know I'm very dorky about food history. We discussed this previously on the show. So I was excited to see how basically the um, plot revolved around the cellar and food and how the preservation of it and how it can be also be quickly defiled, basically. Like quickly food can be ruined if put into the wrong environment. And that also goes to say with people, if they're put into the wrong environment, they can rot and they can be damaged. And that also foreshadows, of course, Nancy's demise in the cellar. Throughout the show, Dr. Jordan gives Grace vegetables and stuff. Dr. Jordan comes from a upper-class mining family. He hasn't ever had the experience of buying his own vegetables, cooking his own meat. He hasn't had that experience, whereas Grace does. There's a wonderful scene in the book, and I'm sad that they didn't have it in the show, where basically she looks at a parsnip that he brings her, and she says, well, it's rotten. Um, basically, the whole parsnip thing led to, like, well, what, Grace, what would you want to have brought to you? And she says, a radish, because they're in season. Because she has to be aware, because of her job, to, like, what food would be available in season, even though she's not the one who's preparing the food anymore, because she's mostly involved with the seamstress work at at the uh, warden's house. But she is aware of, like, what is good right now, and what wouldn't be good right now. And that is something that, in the domestic sphere, was very important, because with lack of refrigeration, uh, you had to use basically what you have, what is available, and try to preserve as much as you can, like, say... So, near the end of the show, it's in the final episodes, Jeremiah, also known as um, Dr. Jerome, he is basically been working as a mesmerist for a hypnot. He basically hypnotizes her and gets her to go through this, the Kinnear house and explain what happened. Ask her if she was in the cellar of Mr. Kinnear's house on Friday the 28th of July, 1843. Three. Grace, the cellar. Picture the cellar. Go back in time. Descend in space. Grace goes, yes. Along the hallway, lift the trap door. Down the cellar stairs. Barrels, whiskey, vegetables, and boxes full of sand. There on the floor. Yes, I was in the cellar. And while that is just a small little scene, it sort of gives you an, a picture of the things that they kept down there in the cellar to keep things cool, to keep things fresh. Boxes of sand just to just sort of put vegetables in to keep them good as long as possible. The first fresh uh, fruit or vegetable that Dr. Jordan gives her is an apple, which is very symbolic, of course, for her because of the whole apple scene with Mary Whitney. But it's also because it is fresh and it isn't, it hasn't been wrinkled because with apples, you're meant to sort of separate them and keep them in a um, heightened environment. I, I learned to like how to preserve apples like last year, you're meant to sort of separate them and elevate them so that there's airflow so that they can stay fresh as long as possible, not get moldy. So him delivering this to her was um, just sort of a sign of what she was sort of getting into, but it's also, of course, the memory. Anyways, I was just fascinated by the use of preservation techniques and the details of like how this was done in this time, in this piece. I'm glad that Margaret Atwoods puts in so much detail into the domestic sphere. Because even though we can't trust Grace about, like, her historians, there is this level of historical detail that is remarkable, basically, about the sort of day-to-day life, the, the sort of chores that everyone goes through, the preservation techniques that, like, why would she lie about that? And it's just, it's very interesting. I also think it's important to discuss how basically the relationship at the Kinnear's house, where everyone was basically so close to one another that it was difficult to separate the private and the working life. 
Yeah. So Grace is in two different situations of domestic employership that we see in the mini series. The first couple of episodes, which we had intended to focus on today and gotten pretty off track from that, she is in a city household. So there is a lot of amenities nearby, and it is an incredibly female-dominated environment. And there is a wife, so there is a lady of the house, there is housekeepers, and it really is just a very female environment. She ends up transferring to a farmsteader household. Uh, and it's it's a very nice farm, it's less of a working farm and more of a uh, gentleman's estate farm, if you will. But we see mixed company among the servants and the dynamics that that brings in. And we don't have a lady of the household presumably reinforcing the morality of the man of the household. However, that is not to by any way suggest that married men are not rapists. That's beside the point. Uh, Or that married men are always faithful. Uh, Or that married men aren't coercive. But the show does a very good job of showing two very different domestic environments. Mm -hmm. Yes. Whereas at the Alderman Parkinson's, there was sort of this level of distance between the two. At the Kinnear residence, there's very little people there. And so everyone is basically just all within each other's business. And you sort of see sort of the difference with Nancy. Because Nancy, sometimes she'll be nice and lovely and she'll want to have tea and spend time with Grace. Other times, she's completely just really mean or um, controlling, and that could just be Grace's point of view. We, she could have just been, you know, just giving out orders and, like, Grace wasn't listening. Anyways, just sort of seeing how the difference between those those sides of her is part of her wants to have this private life. She wants to have friends. She wants to have these connections. But also, she can't because she is this housekeeper in a household. And she does not want to go back to being a servant or is afraid to go out on the streets with her child. She wants to have the authority and the safety that her role provides. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's a good analysis of Nancy Montgomery. And again, like taking that away from trying to internalize uh, what's going through the characters' heads and understanding the social forces they're situated in. The physical difference of being in a city versus being in a more rural homesteader. The domestic responsibilities are very, very different. And we still have, despite the fact that women in settler culture are incredibly important and we see a blurring of the lines in women being outside and being more physical a lot more in rural settings and in homesteader settings. We are still very conscious of the fact that McDermott is not a household servant. McDermott is a barn servant. He works in the yard. He does labor that way. Uh, He sleeps in the loft of the barn. And Grace, while she's still doing many activities that aren't applicable in the city, she doesn't have to care for animals in the city. There's a very visceral scene, not in the first couple episodes, but later on, where Grace is tasked with killing a chicken. And you get that sense of the fact that city life has already begun to sanitize for some. In the domesticity of the city, because you have sectors of labor being focused in different areas. You have butcher shops, you have all of that. You are already taking some of these things out of the household. You end up with a more female-dominated household. And arguably, we are accustomed to viewing that city as more civilized. So that gives us the sense that in this time period, civility means separation of the sex, separation of gender roles. And when you get into that other environment that's less well established, that's more rural, that's less urbane, there's less division between them. And that ultimately puts some people under greater scrutiny. And if we talk about reputation being the touchstone for every part of your life in this period, Grace's reputation is at greater risk in the less female-dominated environment. I think this series does a very good job of showing that. I agree. I'm really glad they, like, after I read the book and that they kept the scene on her birthday where she and Jamie Walsh chat and make flower crowns. Sort of the day is ruined because it turns out everyone's been watching them and everyone is making assumptions that they were doing things that they shouldn't be, even though they're just children. And that has a very good line in that 
scene where Grace is in her mid to late teens now and Jamie Walsh is a man the same age as her or a teenager the same age as her. He's not a man yet because women are in this period viewed as being adults so much younger. And I think that that perspective that persists today, you know, we do have this attitude where we expect women to be mature faster and we hold women accountable for their immaturities much younger than we do men. I think that is well shown in this because of the domestic duties that 16, 17 year old Grace has. Compared to the rather, rather un, uh, like, Jacob Walsh does not really have any responsibilities. Uh, he, like, he doesn't. He's 15 or 16, he gets to putz around with hay in his mouth and bugging the neighbor. Playing the pan pipe too. He's only occasionally given chores, he's not really given much to do. Yeah, I might be on McDermott's side, but side that like we didn't need to hear that whistle get true there. i mean who needs to hear a pan pipe in general not this person not me i don't need it yeah what else oh, you got? I, I think that's pretty much all i really wanted to cover i also think it was the detail about the red flannel petticoat yes I think we should feel we should save that for gender. I think so as well, and I kind of want to look at more stuff on periods in this time, examining how this was done. So I'll go back to that later, but... If it's alright with you, I did have one more quote that I thought was really well phrased about immigration. And this actually comes from the preamble to a UN on immigration, which is why I've saved it to the end because it's less historically rooted, but it's just an observation that I felt was very well phrased. And this is the subtitle of the report on Canadian immigration, and it describes Canada as a country of half welcomes. And this preamble talks about pre-confederation and the trends in Europe immigration. I think that that is a very well stated, like that's a good quip, a country of half welcomes, because there is so much, so many push forces and so many pull forces trying to get individuals into Canada and into other colonial holdings during this period. But there is so much suspicion around people who are migrating. And this goes back to the way that European identities are formed in the early modern period into the modern period, is you have this real sense of suspicion around anyone who is not from your area. And kinship ties, again, are so important in this period that there is an era of suspicion anytime someone is leaving where they come from. And society, as it's coagulating at this time, is taking identities into account and imposing identities into account that build a hierarchy and build a assessment of value. This series takes place prior to Confederation, but one of the first few things that comes from Confederation starts to be acts on immigration. John A. MacDonald is noted for his responsibility for the national policy, which was created by the federal government in the year we confederated, 1867. It had three parts. It had the creation of a rail line, it had a tariff policy, and it had a so-called settlement program. Later on, we have the Dominion Lands Act, which is, again, a uh, sponsorship program for you get land. There is a registration fee uh, associated with this, which is, there's always a bureaucrat's fee. But we have uh, historical figures like one of our first ministers of immigration, Clifford Sifton, who articulates exactly what he thinks should be the type of people being welcomed into our country. He wanted not strictly poor people because he was concerned about filth, disease, starvation, criminality. He wanted, there's a quote, stalwart peasant, sheepskin coat, born on soil, whose forefathers had been farmers for generations with a good stout wife and a half dozen children. This is good quality. Like, this is when Canada itself, being confederated, now wants to push further west. And, you know, if you've read up on this, I, I'm sure lots of people have seen the sort of advertisements that make the west mm -hmm. look amazing. It was not. But yeah, like, this series is 
very it's nuanced and it's nuanced in a way that centers around domesticity centers around immigration and it's subtle which i think is both good and bad for understanding those themes i think that recognizing this was never intended to be a documentary recognizing that this is a adaptation of a fictionalization Mm -hmm. of a court case and recognizing that these are primarily entertainment things i do think that there is some knowledge to be gleaned if you know where to look for it what are your thoughts yes yeah I think so as well. I think that the show is a really good adaptation and it's fascinating to watch, but in, but yeah, it's definitely like if you're going to watch it, just know that it is a fictionalized account and that it is not based in reality. Like there is a lot of stuff and we will be including the uh, confessions. Like you can't really trust Grace, but there is still a lot of interesting details that you can look at that are very important in discussing Canadian history and in can- discussing early Canadian immigration and domesticity during this time. I think that this show does a really good job of those things, but yeah, like Sloan said, it it is very subtle. Yeah, and if if you want to watch this because you want to see some good drama, like, if that's... There's nothing wrong with that. No one's judging you for that, or at least Victoria and I aren't. But we, in this episode and in the next two episodes we're going to do surrounding this, really want to challenge you. Grace could be anybody. My interest in this, this story could be not about Grace. This story could be not from any particular person's perspective. I just want to look at how well they depict the years that this is meant to take place in, in the locality it's meant to take place in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm very interested in seeing how just life in general is portrayed, like life at this time, because it's brutal, it's harsh, it's not easy, like there is so much work that needs to be done, like at this time, if you are a person like Grace, if you even want to live, you have to spend most of your time doing all this work for nothing, you're basically room and board and a little bit of money, that's it. So you're just basically living to work, not working to live. I mean, if you're also wanting to watch this show, Zachary Levi is in it, and he is fantastic. That's the guy who plays Jeremiah, right? Yes. He also plays Shazam. Flynn Rider. Oh, does he voice Flynn Rider? He voices Flynn Rider. No, really? He does. If you listen to it, it is Zachary Levi. That's weird. That's weird. I can't cope with that. He also plays Fandral in the last two Thor movies. That's that's fine. I... uh... I'm confused by the Flynn Rider thing. Uh, that's I, I'm highly confused by that, but that's fine. Dr. Simon Jordan, who is perhaps, like, uh, the secondary main character. Uh, I'll suggest that much. <laughs> he's the bad guy from the first Kingsman movie. Oh my god, you're right! Yeah, like, he's, uh, if you've seen the first Kingsman movie, he's the one with the robot arm, I think. I haven't seen the first Kingsman movie, I've only seen the second one. (laughs) But he is briefly in the second one. Oh yeah, he has the robot arm in the second one, because he blow- does he blow up in the first one? There's a flashback in the second movie that's him with hair. Because he's got a shaved head, uh, not in the flashback in the second movie. It took me a while to realize. It it took me a few watch-throughs of both before I realized it was the same actor. Yes. Yeah, that's him. He plays Charlie. Yeah. Heard Holcroft. He plays Charlie Hesketh. That's that's his role. And then there's Elton John. Yes, Elton John is not an alias Chris. No, he is not. Gosh, I wish he was, though. Just imagine, though. Just imagine. He would be on the pew with Margaret Atwood. I don't think Elton John slut shames. No, but he would be co conspirator I stand by what I said. I don't think Elton John slut shames. Uh, I'm trying to think of who else is of note, because this is a CBC show, so there are a few actors that are noticeable. The person who plays Mary Whitby, I don't even know if the show I'm thinking of got more than one episode, because it was on for a couple episodes, and then it was off, and I can't figure out if it was cancelled or not. I could Google it, but I'm not. But uh, Franny Drake Mysteries, which is like a sequel to Murder. I know what, yeah, I know the one you're talking uh, about, though. has... There's a constable. She's very nice. She's very young. She's a lady. She plays Mary Whitby. 
Uh, she's pretty cool. He's also in a show called Houdini and Doyle. Okay, so Houdini and Doyle or Republic of Doyle? Because that's also a serious Houdini show. and Doyle. It's basically where Harry Houdini and Sir Arthur Conan Doyle solve suspiciously supernatural crimes together. Interesting. And it has the whole Mulder and Scully element. And yes, she does play a constable in that as well. She's also um, Houdini's love interest, which I was not there for. I don't know how much historical merit I think is in the show you've just described to me. I'm rather skeptical. There is none, uh, because Harry Houdini was very loyal to his wife. That's not what I meant. (laughs) But also, yeah, solving crime, no. Houdini investigated no. spiritualists yeah. and, like, debunked them. And Sir Arthur Conan Doyle was a spiritualist. did help solve one crime, but that was it. He, he was a very ardent spiritualist. And that was why their friendship fell apart. Because Doyle invited Houdini to a seance with his wife, and then Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's second wife, basically, she supposedly summoned Houdini's mother. And... He was using just cross imagery. Well, that doesn't fly because A, she was speaking English, and B, crosses. Because if you know anything about Harry Houdini, he was Hungarian. His mother only spoke Hungarian. And she was Jewish. They were both Jewish. So that effectively ended their friendship and sent Houdini on his quest to solve spiritualism. Victoria, if you ever impersonate my dead mother to try to get me to believe in ghosts, my mother's alive, everybody. This is this is a future warning to Victoria. If you ever do that, our friendship will probably be over. Sorry. And I am releasing all the outtakes from this podcast. <laughs> hey, I people want to hear the Paddington speech. No. They want to know. They don't know. want that. They don't want to hear you talk about Shrek. Uh, thanks to everybody who's still listening. Uh, we haven't recorded in a while, and we'll see how much of this I leave in. Maybe just crunching of my gluten-free pizza crust. Yes. I was also just going to say, I would never try to impersonate your uh, your dead mother just for future Sloan. I would never hold a seance because I do not want to invite in negative energy or ghosts. I got a Ouija board throw pillow on my bed. See, that's too, too close for me. I can't do it. Sure, I've got the planchette necklace, but that's it. We're not going to use it to summon ghosts. Don't want that energy. That's cute that you think it's the board that gets haunted and not the planchette. Well, it's the talking to the spirits, because you're opening things up. So we've previously established that uh, I am the Jamie Heineman in our friendship, and you are the Adam Savage. However, I think what we're discovering is I am the Shane Madej, and you are the Ryan Vegara. And I can accept that. We, we know this, uh, but... I would come up with the hot dog uh, if we were to, to ever do something like that. That would be a, a Victoria thing. Yeah, please don't bring a puppet to our next D&D session. No, but Simon! Please don't. Fine. Okay, now I feel mean. You can do it if you want. <sighs> Yay! <sighs> I don't even want to do this anymore. <laughs> Um, yeah. Uh, thanks to everybody who's still listening. Welcome to some new listeners. We continued to see our numbers go up during our hiatus, so presumably some of you are new. Yes. Hey, how's it going? As always, we are going to have show notes, uh, social media, our email, links to the blog that... Victoria is pretty much the only one of us who's contributing to at this point. Hey, I haven't written in like six months on their Sloan. Uh, okay, so you know what? We're not going to bother having a link to the blog. <laughs> Maybe this one. We'll have the link to the blog, but I promise I have a bunch of content planned out for the blog because that's fun. Uh, I'm going to be doing a summer reading list. Historical fiction and non-fiction reading list. I will have some contributions for that. Awesome. You got it. Uh, we do have a Patreon. Thank you. If anyone wants to check that out, we've got some pretty accessible tiers. 
couple of neat things that go along with that. Uh, something I will throw out there is we do have a couple of options that let you vote on future episode topics, and we will be pursuing those once Trilogy is done. So definitely a good time to think about jumping on. Uh, Victoria, you got anything else to add? Uh, the patrons we already have are awesome. They've been really just great, helpful, and also, like, we're just ha- grateful to have their support and their feedback and advice. It's really nice. They see it as just a f- familial holiday, whereas I see it, like, I see it as a reminder of a bad institution. Have a great day, everyone. Before we sign off, Sloan and I would like to acknowledge that McEwen University, this podcast, and all the content we create are located and produced on Treaty 6 territory. This land has traditionally and continues to be a home, place of gathering, and meeting ground for many Indigenous peoples. This includes the Nakota Sioux, Nitsitapi, Métis, Salto, and Cree First Nations. You can find our podcast on all of your favorite podcast directories and on YouTube. You can find us on Twitter, at hist.mac, Instagram, which is at history at Mac, or on Facebook under the name of the Interdisciplinary History Group at McEwen. We will leave links to these social media pages and our blog in the description box of your favorite podcast directory. If you would like to be a guest or have a suggestion for a future episode or blog post topic, leave this. Please let us know by shooting an email to interdisciplinaryhistgroupmu at gmail.com. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this episode. Stay tuned for our next recording. Goodbye. Have a nice day. Stay safe. Wear a mask. All right, take two. Just for you. I know that there's going to be multiple different versions, so I figured as long as you want extra. Before we sign off, Sloan and I would like to acknowledge that McEwen University, this podcast, and all the content we create are located and produced on Treaty 6 territory. This land has traditionally and continues to be a home, place of gathering, and meeting ground for many Indigenous peoples. This includes the Nakota Sioux, Nitsitapi, Métis, Salto, and Cree First Nations. You can find our podcast on all of your favorite podcast directories and on YouTube. You can find us on Twitter, at hist.mac, Instagram, which is at history at Mac, all lowercase, or on Facebook under the name of the Interdisciplinary History Group at McEwen. We will also leave these link- links We will also leave links to these social media pages and our blog in the description box below. If you would like to guest or have a suggestion for a future episode or blog post topic, please let us know by shooting an email to interdisciplinaryhistgroupmu at gmail.com. That is I-N-T-E-R-D-I-S-C-I-P-L-I-N-A-R-Y-H-I-S-T-G-R-O-U-P-M-U at gmail.com. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this episode. It means so much to Sloan and I. We are really grateful, and we hope to keep on doing this in the future. All right. I'll, uh, I'll let you go now, but stay tuned for the next recording. It'll be up soon, so stay tuned. All right. Bye! Wear a mask, wear a mask, stay safe. Da, 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 da. Number three. Three. All right. Before we sign off, Sloan and I would like to acknowledge that McEwen University, this podcast, and all the content we create are located and produced on Treaty 6 territory. This land has traditionally and continues to be a home, place of gathering, and meeting ground for many Indigenous peoples. This includes the the Nakota Sioux, Nitsitapi, Métis, Salto, and Cree First Nations. You can find our podcast on all of your favorite podcast directories and on YouTube. You can find us on Twitter at hist.mac, Instagram, which is history at hit, Instagram, which is at history at Mac, or on Facebook under the name of Interdisciplinary History Group at McEwen. We will leave links to these social media pages and our blog in the description box below on 
any of your favorite podcast directories. If you would like to guest or have a suggestion for a future episode or blog post topic, please let us know by shooting an email to interdisciplinaryhistorygroupmu at gmail.com. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this episode. Please stay tuned for our next recording. We're really excited for it. Okay, bye! We're back.